How's everybody doing? Good? Good? Awesome. Um, so, as you guys know me, if you follow me, I'm into self-experimentation. Um, it's kind of my thing. So today I'm going to talk about um, self-experimentation and how you can optimize your health and your performance, kind of how I see it and how you know I like to encourage others to do it because I know other people like to do it. So um, before we get started, a little bit about me. I've been an athlete my whole life. Uh, I played football and track. Um, I, I played football in college. I did capoeira. I did CrossFit. I did powerlifting. I did Muay Thai. Um, recently, because of keto, I've been able to run a half marathon, obstacle course races, and um, indoor rowing is my newest thing. Um, and of course, uh, before anything else, I'm a father to my two boys, Desmond and Dean, which you guys have either heard or seen. That, that I can guarantee. <laughs> um, and I'm husband to Maura, aka Fat Field Mom. Um, of course, yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> Um, I'm a podcast host uh, with Keto Evangelist himself, Brian, and um, if any of you follow that and listen to it, you know, I apologize, you know, I really do, because <laughs> we just, you know, the first 20 minutes are going to be whatever we want to talk about, this is how it goes. So um, I'm a very mediocre YouTuber, um, we have like 5,000 people, we haven't made a video in like six or seven months, plenty of footage, a lot of footage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so if that's worth anything. Um, and I'm also a meat aficionado. I, I love meat. I've always loved meat. And when I found out that I didn't have to eat plants, um, I was very thrilled. And so, um, so my purpose on this planet is to help as many people take care or take charge of their health, improve their health, and improve their performance as possible. Um, the second one is to help as many families do that with their kids as possible. And the last one is to get as many people to think about stuff as possible. Let's go a little bit deeper than, you know, 75, you know, percent fat, 5% carbs and 20% protein. Let's go a little bit deeper than the typical things that you hear at first. They're great, um, but let's examine things because if we do, we could have some nice little surprises. And, you know, I, I've seen it in my life and I've, I know there's a, a few people that I've worked with that have also seen it. So, um, of course, this is my family. Um, those are my boys. That's Dean and Desmond. Um, killing it right there with that outfit. <laughs> this kid has, well, actually both of them have uh, a better, pretty much a better shoe game, a uh, better bow tie game, better moccasin game than I've ever had. And um, this is us recently in Cuba. A uh, fantastic trip that we, that we took. It was a cruise and we, um, we spent nine hours, but those were nine very memorable hours. Um, so first I want to ask you guys, who's tried self-experimentation here? All right, cool. So I, I just want to, let's, let's see, who wants to just give me a, one of their best, like biggest learnings that they've gotten from self-experimentation? Yeah. Your body can just do wonders. Like yeah. you slowly add things and remove things and <laughs> see what you actually need or what you don't need and how your body's affected by it. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And the, I like that you said that because... One of the first things I noticed about keto about two years ago was that I was just so much more sensitive to anything that I did to my body. You know, I think that, you know, I mentioned it to Brian and he, I told him, you get rid of these carbs and you get rid of this background noise. And so he's like, ooh, I like that. Carbs are noise, you know, because they are, right? I mean, I, my whole life I've tried to find the best way to do things, the, the best way to get an edge over the competition. And it's been kind of like a, a lot of guesswork up until I was keto, because when I was keto, now all of a sudden I would remove something and I would be like, wow, I feel a difference. So carbs really are noise and carbs are very, very hard to manage and, and to find the perfect way to, to, to get that performance benefit without all the other stuff that can come from eating carbs. So, you know, why should we do self-experimentation? The first thing is, for me, it's to learn about our bodies because, um, especially over time, I've noticed myself throughout my journey, and I've heard a lot of people here talk about how I've been keto for three years, and this worked for the first year, it hasn't worked in the last two years. You know, so you have to always continue to optimize and, 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 and experiment to see what, what's working. I'll, I'll share kind of one of my biggest ones that, uh, re recently with you guys. Um, the other thing is to fix health issues and improve performance. So if you have a list of things that, that have improved with keto, and all of a sudden you're going down that list, this one's gone, this one's gone, this one's gone, 
This one's still lingering. We are starting to find out how powerful food is. It's, it's ridiculously powerful how we can take control of our health and we don't need anybody. We don't need this healthcare system that screwed us all in a million ways. I'm dealing with it right now. Um, and we can use it to improve performance. You know, there may be something like you have a theory on something that you can use or change that may give you a, a, an edge. And um, of course, in response to new data or new trends, and the, the biggest one for me, obviously, recently is, is carnivore, right? Because everybody's like, oh, carnivore's cool, let me try it. You know, a lot of people got to get over that mental hurdle. That's why I'm very happy that my wife is a carnivore, because if I was standing here and telling all these women to eat meat, they're not going to listen to me, because <laughs> I'm just a guy, I love meat. But then when my wife tells them, I think it's much more powerful. So I'll give a few, um, well, first, let's talk a little bit about how to do it. So this is how I think you should do it. So you start with your purpose. So you know, if you know the, the scientific method is basically you have a hypothesis. This is what I think is gonna happen. And then you observe what, what you do and you see if your observations match your hypothesis or not. In a perfect world, you would have no bias, right? We're all gonna have a little bit of bias, but you're trying to remove as much bias as possible. And then of course, you're gonna establish your timeline and main endpoint or endpoints. There may be a few things, and you wanna do that right from the beginning. Um, I, I understand that there's a lot of the time, you know, there are things that happen that you didn't even expect, but for the most part, you wanna to try to establish those main endpoints. You wanna give yourself a good amount of time. Um, I think for most experiments, a week is just gonna be very, very short. Like, I would say, you know, three to four weeks minimum is your minimum amount of time. And then you're gonna summarize your key learnings in your mind or, or on paper somewhere where you can just have everything there and then you can try to figure out next the plan on how to proceed in light of your findings. You know, it's really cool to do an experiment and to say, okay, I did this for a week, but if, you, if all you do is try that new thing and then you just don't do anything, then to me, it's a waste of time. You know, so you gotta be very intentional with this stuff. So I'll give you guys, oh, here's some objective method, uh, measures. And you guys probably see these because I do them all the time. I took a break from this uh, while, I'm on, while I'm here. I didn't bring my meter because I knew if I did, I would do it anyway. She knows. <laughs> um, she's like, you know, I wake up every morning and she's like in bed because she wakes up kind of the same time. And she has to wait an extra 30 minutes for me to make the coffee because I'm doing, testing my blood ketones, <laughs> testing my blood sugar, doing all that stuff. So um, blood glucose, blood ketones, breath ketones, um, heart rate variability, which I actually haven't done heart rate variability yet, but I'm really interested in that. But I also have to manage things because it's always a question of like, what's the new thing that I'm going to spend money on? And then I get in trouble if I do that. So it has to be a good reason for me to get uh, um, one of those things. So um, of course, if you're managing, if you're looking at something for improving performance, you want to look at, you know, weight, reps, time, um, your body weight, your body fat percentage, your body measurements. Um, and then subjective measures, you're gonna look at mood, energy levels, the quality of your workouts, uh, mental focus. There's a, objective ways to, to measure this. There's actually some really cool apps now that you can um, really see how your, um, your mental acuity is, is improving and your cognitive performance is improving. And your sleep quality, of course, subjective, but that can also be objective, you know, with these things like the, uh, the aura ring and the, um, there's another one that is not a ring, I think it's a, a watch or something, but um, so, those are, so those are some subjective measures. Now, here are some of my examples of what I've done. Um, intermittent fasting is kind of something that I've done from the beginning. Extended fasting, uh, I've only done 40 to 42 hours a few times, and, and those for me, as an athlete, um, I just don't see the benefit of an extended fast. You know, I don't really have any big underlying issues that I'm trying to fix, and I love to be at my top uh, performance, and so for me, an extended fast doesn't really make sense. Exogenous ketones, uh, I've tried, I tried them last year, and I recently tried them again. Um, that's one of those things that, so last year, I, I shared that when I was trying to cut down to 6% body fat, um, I, I took exogenous ketones as a pre-workout with caffeine, and um, at the time I was working with Robert Sykes and we were trying to, he kept asking me, how are your workouts, how are your workouts? Because he knew that once you got to a certain point when that body fat started to dip low, your workouts would, would probably decrease in quality, uh, you'd lose a little bit of energy. And I can say that 
even when I was at a really big deficit, um, I, I didn't really see a dip in performance. And so I think it was the exogenous ketones. So when people ask me about exogenous ketones now, I will say that um, for the most part, the, the, it's well documented for any neurodegenerative disease that exogenous ketones are gonna really be helpful. Um, from a performance standpoint, there was a recent study that uh, Finney and Volick talked about with exogenous ketones and caffeine, and uh, that showed some promise for endurance performance. I personally haven't quite figured out um, you know, how to use them best. I think you know, if you're dieting and you're in a big deficit, you may wanna try it with some, like, like I said, as a pre-workout with caffeine, or um, if you wanna like, get as much help with mental performance as possible, um, I actually just, Anthony Gustin, if you guys know the perfect keto company, I just tried his uh, keto nootropic and that stuff is awesome. I'm actually on that right now. So I'm like on point. <laughs> so, um, so my first foray into being a carnivore was August Surf and Turf. And so the, the way that all worked out was in July of last year, um, I, was, I was finishing up my, my cut with Robert and I just... I think Brian and I were talking a lot at the time about, you know, just eating meat. And then someone's like, you know, you really like meat. You know, you should follow this guy, Sean Baker. And so I saw him and then I started following him. And then the first podcast I heard was in July of last year uh, with Fahad Ahmad, Keto Geek. And he just asked really awesome questions and he talked to Dr. Baker. And I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm gonna do this. And, uh, and Brian was like, at the time, he's like, you know, I, I think I really like salmon and I really like beef. He's like, so I think I'm just gonna eat salmon and beef for a month. That's Brian's, you know, Brian's not like me, Brian doesn't do all this other stuff. Brian's like, I feel good, I don't feel good. And so I was like, oh, I like that. So Brian and I did August Surf and Turf, and it was basically one month of only eating anything that came from a cow and any type of salmon. And that month was just amazing. Like I had finished my cut and I was already super lean, and then I got leaner, but then I also experienced some of these performance benefits. And that's what I tell people with keto is awesome, but, but carnivore for me has given me the best performance increase in this last two years. You know, I hit a three second PR on my 500 meter row that I hadn't touched in years. And then I, I got another two second PR recently on that one. So um, it's uh, for, to get five seconds on a PR on a, on a sprint that's already you know, pretty fast is, is good. Like I was at 124 in July or so of last year. And the first month I got down to 121 and now I'm at a 119 um, 500 meter row. And so all these things that I'm experiencing is, is from meat. And so I, I got a lot out of that. Now, the one thing that I will say with this one is that I miss bacon. Um, I, I missed, I wanted to have things just because I couldn't have them. And so but it was, it, was, it was a good experience. Um, Robert and I um, are always doing everything together pretty much. Um, we pretty much have a one day a week conversation that's like an hour just so we can make sure we, can, we, we get back together because you know that's my boyfriend. So um, <laughs> we, we make sure we connect. If not, we both get. But he, <laughs> he texted me one morning, probably like at 3.30 in the morning, and he was like, hey man, I got an idea. And I was like, what is it? Because I was up too. <laughs> And he's like, oh man, I've been up all night just thinking about everything that I'm gonna do. So we, we did this hypertrophy experiment. And what we did, it was three months of putting ourselves in a 500 calorie surplus from where we were. We, it wasn't that scientific in the sense that we didn't look at our RMRs. We just knew at the time, because both of us are psycho and track everything, uh, we knew what the amount of calories it would be for us to be at, um, just keep our weight stable, right? So we just each added 500 to that. And so the first month we were looking at it from um, 500 extra calories of protein. Then the second month was 500 extra calories of fat. And then the third month was a mixture of both. And I would say of the three months, the, the third month was probably the best, even though the measures that we took, it didn't seem like there was a big difference, but I felt the best and I think it was the best uh, combination. Um, and I'll come back to this because this is one of the main reasons why I did our cutting experiment in January at, in um, Keto Evangelist Unlimited, which is our membership site, because I started to see some of the changes. And I, and I, I like to tell people that we always talk about how, or we hear that 
once you're fat adapted, you may need to decrease fat and you'll be able to use your body's stored fat um, a little bit more efficiently as energy. And I was always kind of suspicious of that because I feel like all of us want things really fast. We live in a world where everything is like super quick. And so because of that, everybody's like, all right, it's been two weeks. I'm fat adapted. Let's go. Time to cut the fat, you know? And if, if you do it too early, I think it actually will, will go against you. And so for me, if I'm really being honest, I was probably fully fat adapted at one and a half years because I didn't start to feel these things that I, that I started to feel until a year and a half later, and I was kind of doing the same thing that whole time. Um, the no dairy, no sweeteners, that was something that we did this year. March Madness was basically where I decided that I was going to train every day, no matter what, and I did that. And um, I wasn't hitting any PRs, but I, I did pretty well. Um, now, this one was a really interesting one that I did recently. It was a high-protein experiment. As soon as um, Jimmy and Dr. Lemansky said that they were going to do this, uh, this protein thing, um, I saw it, and then I saw in the comments, Jimmy was like, yeah, I've never done three-to-one protein um, to fat, so this is going to be interesting. And I was like, what? So I texted Jimmy. I was like, three-to-one? What is this? He's like, call me. And so I was like, <laughs> so... so um, I call him, I'm like, what the heck are you doing? What is this? And he's like, well, Dr. Naaman talks about this is a great protocol for losing weight and we wanted to try this. And I was like, okay. And then so then my wheels started spinning and I started to think, okay, every time I do something, I like to take it to its logical end. I just try to see like how far I can go. And then if it's, bad, if it's too, too much, I'll bring it back in, right? So um, when he did that, I just quietly stayed quiet. I kind of like halfway through, I knew what I was going to do, but I didn't want people to not pay attention to him. So I waited until they were done. And then I was like, hey guys, check it out. I'm gonna do something too. And so I said, I wanted to do a two to one protein to fat experiment. And he was doing uh, 1.5 times his lean body mass. So he was eating 270 grams of protein with 90 grams of fat. And so what I did was I did 1.25 times my lean body mass, which was 260 grams of protein and 130 grams of fat. And the reason why was I, I had just done this, um, cutting experiment with Keto Vangelist Unlimited where I, I had tested what would happen if I cut fat. And, um, and so I wanted to see how much could I cut the fat because I'm, I'm, I'm eating a lot of meat. I'm feeling the satiety from the protein, which I didn't think would happen if I cut the fat too much. But I really started to realize that the protein has a really good satiating effect. Um, and so I said, okay, I'm going to do body fat at the beginning of the month, body fat in the middle of the month and body fat at the end of the month. And let's see what happens. And I'm gonna be able to adjust these macros because I also wanna see what I'm gonna do moving forward. Like now that I've changed all these things, what am I gonna do with my tracking? Because I can't stop tracking because every time I do, I eat too much and it's just crazy. So, so the first two weeks um, I did the um, two to one and I, I, I felt good the first day and then I felt good the second day and then the third day I was ravenous. I didn't feel as good. And then I started to, my workout started to suffer. And so um, two weeks later, I had lost a good amount of body fat, but I had also lost some lean mass. And so what I decided to do was, let me just try one to one, lean, uh, one times my lean body mass for protein and just match that number with fat. Because when I was typical keto, I was closer to like a, an 80% or even as high as 82% um, fat with my protein as low as 15%. And sometimes... You know, last year, my protein was as low as 75 grams a day. I was under 120 for several months, and I didn't lose any fat. But when you eat meat and your main source of food is protein, there's just no question that your protein's going to go up. So I was like, what is this new paradigm? What are my macros going to be with this new paradigm? And I found at the end of that month was that um, one-to-one with uh, one times my lean body mass for protein and match that number with fat is what works for me. And so when people ask me, you know, which is almost every day, what should my macros be? <laughs> uh, and I'm always trying to help people with macros. I always ask them, you know, are you carnivore? Are you doing just regular keto? And I, I tell people, if you're carnivore, it, it might be a good idea to start with one times lean body mass and then match that number with fat and then go from there. So um, what ended up happening at that year and a half mark, if you remember what I was talking about, was that a few things started to happen. I was getting DEXA scans and I I had lost all the visceral fat, which I had zero vis visceral fat, which is great, but adding all this fat to my meat, because I was carnivore, but I was still focusing on these, hitting these macro ratios, you know, so I was adding butter 
and I was and I was eating extra fat. So I started to put on a little bit of subcutaneous fat, which I don't like that, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not unhealthy, but I, I wasn't a fan. And then I was also seeing some changes in the bathroom, going to the bathroom more often. And so I was like, what happens if I cut fat? And so when we did that in January, that's why I led, that led me to this lower fat version of keto that I'm doing now. So um, the next one that I want to do is a super starch experiment, which I've had super starch sitting in my cabinet for about two years. You know, when I first started keto, about five, six months after, I was like, I'm going to do a half marathon, because right? you just get all this energy and you just want to do everything. So um, I got super starch and I, I never really used it. I never really felt the need for it. And so what I want to look at with this super starch experiment is we know that if you're fat adapted, the FASTER study has shown that you're able to use um, fat as fuel at a much higher percentage of your VO2 max. So your typical sugar burner is once they get past, like let's say 70% of their VO2 max, they're going to start using sugar as energy. Well, us fat adapted athletes can go at a higher percentage of our VO2 max using fat as energy, as, as high as 80 to 85%. And what does that do? That spares our glycogen stores. So now we have those glycogen stores for when we really need them, right? But what if we could, what if we could add some more glycogen without a, a, a spike in insulin or any issues with our glucose? So if, if we keep insulin low, we remain in ketosis. So we remain fat adapted. So what I want to see this summer, and I, the reason why, this was out of necessity, because I've been training with Ben Pakulski lately, and he's been killing me. And I'm very scared because <laughs> he's like, we're at about a three right now. And so we're going to slowly build up to a 10. And so I'm dying at a three. And so I'm trying to see what can I add to this so that I can like not break down, because I do think that I'll perform well, but I, my hypothesis is that over time my body may not recover as well and so then my training will suffer so that's what I have uh, coming up this uh, this summer so I'm gonna be looking at that one I'm super super excited about that and also people are always asking how can you build muscle with keto can you build muscle with keto what should I do and I've I feel like I've answered that question but I haven't answered it well and again, I don't want to add any muscle. I haven't wanted to add muscle for two years. And, but I'm just going to take this one for the team for you guys. And I'm probably just going to add a bunch of muscle this summer. Just so we can just show that we can do it. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so if I want to do that, I, I want to look at this as uh, the way to do it and still remain keto. And that we can, so we can tell everybody, all the haters, all the people that, that you know, hate on keto and say that they, you can't do it for performance, because I, I'm well aware of the fact that I didn't build this body with keto. But again, I haven't tried to build muscle for the past two years. I've actually probably done all the things that you're supposed to do to lose muscle, and I don't. So, um, but I do want to see what happens with that. So the key takeaways that I want to give you guys today are you want to be honest with yourself from the beginning and you want to at least try as much as possible to eliminate bias. You, you're, I understand that all of us have a lot of biases, but if we can really try to be conscious of them, it's amazing how much your mindset can affect the results. I'll give you an example. When I first did the, the high protein month with Robert, now, it could be a mixture of two things. I was, I, was, I was suspicious of this. I was like, this is not gonna be good. You know, I was eating 135 grams of protein, now I'm eating 260 grams of protein. This is gonna be a disaster. And it was a disaster, it really was. Um, but it was also that my body wasn't adapted to that higher protein, you know? So what I find now is that I could eat 260, I, I can eat 300 grams of protein in a day. I could test myself the next day and my ketones will be above one. So when people see these mountains of meat on my plate and they say, is that, is that keto? You know, are, well, it is for me because I'm in ketosis. I'm not going to tell you all to do that. You know, we all have, um, there's a few things that will affect with respect to protein, in my opinion. Number one is your lean body mass, if you carry a lot of lean body mass. Uh, number two is your metabolic history, your metabolic health. You know, do you have insulin resistance? And number three is your activity. If you're doing what I'm doing, you'll be in ketosis because you're training twice a day on a lot of days. Um, the second thing is, of course, to do something with what you've learned. You know, really be intentional with these experiments. You know, don't just be going from experiment to experiment just because it's a cool thing to do. It, it is kind of cool. I, I love it. But try to do something with what you learn. And then, of course, stay curious. You know, a lot of you have, 
have never really, um, really put a lot of thought into nutrition until you went keto. And so what happened? Keto helped you and keto helped you treat all these things. And so now you're like, keto is everything. And then, but you want to go deeper into that and really examine because I always use this, this example because it's, it blows my mind. Um, and I say, you know, results, not typical. Uh, but a friend of ours who I wish was here today, cause I would totally pick on her is she's comes from a, an insulin resistance background. She's been keto for two years and she's been doing this carnivore keto cut that we've, that we've been doing where her protein is like literally double what it was before. And she's like texting me the first night. She's like, I'm just really trying to get my head around this. She's like, I'm, I'm having a hard time, but I'm going to trust the process. And all of a sudden, day after day after day, her fasted glucose is lower than, than it was before, and she's hitting the highest ketone number she's ever had. I'm not saying that's going to happen for everybody, but that's a powerful thing when you can try something new and you've learned something new about your body, right? So I wanted to make this um, interactive, so I wanted to see if there's anything that you guys are kind of held up on um, as far as questions, Tongue, Tongue's already ready. So tell me, yeah, I want, I want to hear. What are your thoughts about overactivation of the mTOR pathway and the possible effects on longevity and other things? <sighs> that is, yeah, that, that's one of the things that, oh, that's a hard one because like, you know, we start thinking about things like cancers and we start, from a data standpoint, we don't have the data you know, so um, I'm hoping that nothing happens, but I don't, I'm not convinced at what, at what I see that it would be a, that it would be a, an unsafe thing. I, I'm aware of the fact that it, that it may be, I'm just not convinced. And so like, I have to do, I have to go, this is what I do as a citizen scientist, this is what a lot of us do, right? Is we, we have so much that we want to know, but it's never going to be studied. And so we have to rely on different things. You know, Ted Naiman talks about how, look at the things that we're looking at to judge health. We're looking at cholesterol, garbage, as a, as a health marker. We're looking at all these things on our blood panels. We're looking at, you know, micronutrients, and we're looking at all, all these things when sometimes it's as simple as waist circumference, body fat percentage, muscle. How much muscle are you carrying? How much body fat do you have? What's your waist circumference? How are you performing? I'm not on the, on the far end where I'm just like, I don't care about anything. I don't care about micronutrients. I, 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 don't, I think that's a little bit irresponsible. But at the same time, I do try to, and this is what knowing your body is all about, right? You, you, you're trying to figure out what feels good and, and what works for you. Um, I would love to see more on that. Um, we have, there are some studies. We're going to have Dr. Naiman finally on the podcast. Um, and I am going to ask him because he does have some studies that, um, that look at really, really high protein. Um, we have some that are specifically looking at kidney failure patients or, or kidney disease patients, which is not exactly mTOR, but those are other concerns that people have. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in finding out myself. I don't, I don't have an answer. <laughs> I wish I did, yeah. Yep. Is it mental or is it is it physical? Yeah. Yeah. That's her. That's my wife. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a good question, and it's it's uh it's all about like really establishing your expectations, right? Because so I can tell you what I go through and what I went through and what a lot of people are going through. I'm just like, hey, join the team. That first month, that bathroom, I was visiting that bathroom frequently. You know, you know that's one of the things that you're going to find is there's changes in your gut, right? And so when you go from such a drastic change, it's either constipation or the other way around. And I can tell you that from anyone that I talk to, constipation is never the issue. It's always the opposite. Trust me, okay? <laughs> Trust, okay? Um, from a mental standpoint, it's just, it's a matter of deciding. Are you going to, do I, do I want to do this or not? You know, because from a mental standpoint, um, you know, if, if, you, if you think that this is something, you're curious about it, you can just try it. But for me, I never had the issue because 
I had just gotten used to the fact of eating salads, hanging out with this one so much. She loved salads and she loved her vegetables and she was vegetarian for a while. Uh, she what? Not anymore, yeah. She like, you know, and there, we, we recently heard someone um, say that this is an awesome thing. I don't eat food that I like, I eat food that likes me, right? That to me is an awesome thing, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we, I love peanut butter, I really do. I don't love peanut butter the day after I eat peanut butter, you know? So, um, so Maura, you know, just to give you guys a quick, if, if you haven't heard the story, she was uh, doing a cut last year and she was like, the calories were getting lower and she was, um, the salads, she was trying to add the salads to get that volume again. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night and she'd be vomiting. And it happened like three different times with three different uh, batches of salad or restaurant. We, it wasn't like it was a bad batch of, of, of lettuce, right? So, so we went on a trip to Puerto Rico and um, we spent the weekend there and she's like, I'm just gonna cut the, the veggies out this weekend. And she loses like three or four pounds, right? First day, you know, and she's just like, holy crap, this is awesome, you know? And uh, then she experienced all these other benefits, right? So um, if you have an under, it goes back to like, if you have an underlying issue, um, carnivore, the way I see carnivore is keto, for us, our biggest thing with keto is brain health. You know, it, it affects us. And don't you guys prepare me when you're gonna tell me a story about how we've helped you or something, because like yesterday I had people making me cry and I don't want people to make me cry today, all right? <laughs> so, um, so because brain health for us is the most important thing, we really do think that keto is gonna help with brain health, but then what does carnivore do? Carnivore takes it and improves your gut health too. So now you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting, your brain is on fire, your gut is, is working better than ever, and then the, from the mental health standpoint, um, can I tell him? I'll, I'll just tell him. Yeah, you've, you've shared it. Yeah, she doesn't care. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, Maura has really, really helped depression with keto, but anxiety was still lingering. And then with carnivore, the anxiety is gone. And now the only anxiety we feel is when our kids drive us insane. So, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not bad. I'll take that. That's, it's not real. It's not. So, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I know maybe, you know, a, a lot of times I want to ask what works for you, and I've heard well, what yes. works for me may not work for everybody else, but yeah. what do you do? So what I do, um, and I'm actually now opening, I'm always trying to like okay. question myself. It's, I'm always trying to question like, is this just, am I getting into that mode? Because I, another thing with an intermittent fasting, we were both doing intermittent fasting. We started to extend our fast 18, 20, 22, 24 hours, and we, we ended up doing one meal a day for, for several weeks. And both of us at the time, at, at first, started losing some more fat. And we're like, all right, this is cool. I'm not that hungry, right? And I'm eating at, at night a huge meal. And then after a, a, a three to four week period, it happened to me and then it happened to her, I started to feel softer. Mm -hmm. And then I got a bod pod and then I had lost lean mass. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, this is not good. Yeah. And so I added, a, you know, thanks to Robert, I added um, a post-workout meal and all of a sudden, my lean mass is back up. I'm feeling better. And I realized, because this is, this is why I, you always have to be intentional. You always have to think about, am I doing this because this is really what works for me? Or am I starting to like insert my, my thoughts into this and, and, and extend, like let's say intermittent fasting. Like you're like, you're looking at your watch. It's really not your hunger. You're like, yeah, I got two more hours. I'm starving right now, but I got two more hours. You know, like, <laughs> no. It's not good yet, you know what I'm saying? So, um, so for me, what I've gotten into is, uh, for the last year pretty much, is wake up in the morning, have coffee with some fat, work out, have a big meal for breakfast, lunchtime, have another coffee with fat, dinner, have a big meal, right? And so I've been trying to cut out that second um, coffee at lunchtime, and what I've been doing with that now is like I'm feeling a little bit hungrier. So I'm like, maybe I can eat three meals a day again. Who says I only have to eat two meals, you know? So I'm gonna look at that too, um, but I would say at first to just, if you carnivore specifically, um, just eat when you're hungry. And if it's like three or four meals at first, you know, it's fine. Unless you're really nervous about gaining weight and then you're just like, okay, let me hold, pull back a little bit. And um, because a lot of people do 
gain weight when they do carnivore at first. And I think it goes back to this whole thing like, eat meat and drink water. But yeah, but what about, shut up, eat meat and drink water. <laughs> but no, don't eat four pounds of meat in a sitting and then another four pounds of meat in a sitting. It's not this magical thing that the energy is not just going to disappear, right? So um, definitely think about that. So yeah, that's pretty much it. I, yeah, two, two meals and two coffees, usually. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's easier. Everything's easier. Eating out, everything's easier. Yeah. Plus, I don't even have to have it. She, she has to have hot food, but I don't even need to. I'll take the meat out of the fridge and I'll eat it cold. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So this is something that I've recently, um, that I've really thought about. Um, we're good on time, right? We're about eight, seven, eight minutes at least, right? Yeah. So um, when I went carnivore, I always tell this story because it was amusing to me because I think of myself as a scientist, right? Uh, I'm not doing research, but I, I lost a lot of like my friends who were like RDs. I saw that I had lost them. They weren't following me anymore. I'm like, man, that's not cool. You know, I'm like, do they think that I'm like part of this meat cult and I'm not thinking about these things? I'm thinking about micronutrients. I'm thinking about fiber. I'm thinking about all the things that, that you know, quote unquote, nutrition gurus are thinking about. And so I started to think about what are some things that I can share with people so that they can try to, you know, do that. And so one of the things is, you know, eat fish, right? At least once or twice a week. Eat your organ meats, you know, go for eating those organ meats. Liverwurst and Braunschweiger, if you, if you get, if, you know, if you're like me, you just throw everything and grind it up and put it in burgers, but then your wife gets mad because the house smells, but so, <laughs> you know, get those organ meats. And then the other thing that I started to look at was like macronutrients. And so with this carnivore keto cut, I'm trying to give people guidance on what they should be doing every week. And so the protein macro, the fat macro, and the carb macro, what I told them was, the carb and the fat macros are, are limits. So you want to try to stay, play a game. You try to play, play that game where you stay within five grams of that macro. So if your fat macro is 100, you know, try to go to 95 to 105. Try to keep it there. But if your protein macro is, you know, 120 and, and you go over by 30 grams, don't freak out. Like, that's how I see it. Just because a lot of people have gone through it and they've gone over by mistake and, and I haven't really seen any difference. So... Um, Unless you're really, really full, I'll never tell you to, um, I'll never say to anybody, you know, force feed yourself. But it goes back to being honest with yourself. Because if someone's like, I keep on, I only eat, you know, 800 calories a day and I'm not hungry. And I'm just like, okay, that, that seems like that could happen. There's a lot of things that can you, can, you know, you can be stressed. You'd be one of those people that I wish I was that don't eat when they're stressed. I'm the opposite. Um, and then, so, like, if that's really the case... I don't know what to say because if you don't have, if your hunger's not there, there might be a, another issue because, you know, what happens with a little bit of, um, for instance, with vegans, they are so malnourished that after a while, their body stops getting hungry. That happens. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I don't eat, like, too much fat, like, a lot. Yeah. Anymore, and uh, my carbs are normally under 10. Mm-hmm. I, I would never tell you to do anything. I would. I'm, I, I'm. I'm. I'm against anybody telling anybody to do anything. <laughs> but I would. I, you know, try to try to eat. Um, you know, higher protein foods. You know, the, maybe some leaner protein um, instead of like the fattier cuts. Um, you know, that maybe add. You know, if you're eating like you know, if you're eating all ribeyes, maybe do a ribeye and a sirloin so that you can have some more protein and even be open to the fact of going over on fat and see what happens then. What if you're going over on fat and all of a sudden you lose weight? When we did this cutting experiment in, um, in January when we started, there were some people that are like, I'm starting 500 calories higher than I was before. How is this a cut? You know, what's going to happen to me? Tell me, tell me what's going to happen. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen. Yes. I have no idea what's going to happen. Yes. That's why it's an experiment. Yeah. And it's funny that some of these people were eating four or 500 calories more and all of a sudden lost five to seven pounds in the first week, you know? So maybe, you know, go some period where you, you do eat more protein and the fat goes over 
and see what happens. See if your body is more comfortable and all of a sudden you're performing better at that um, at higher fat and higher protein. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Your, your body's still changing. I'm about 18, 19 months into it. And it is a significantly different metabolic, physiological, yeah. organ-wise, everything. My sleep, my body makes it What you do with your, your physical, I do cognitive. Oh, that's okay? good, yeah. And so I practice your sleep, you know, memory, all of that. So with that, though, go, go back and do some of the prior experiments because you're a different being now than yeah. you were previously, and you're going to get different results. That is so true. And, so, and yeah. Yeah, and that's what I've found. So, you know, uh, uh, the, the things with sleep, the mechanics of sleep, things that didn't have an impact before, I went back, revisited them. Oh, wow, this is giving us 34% here. That's awesome. Before it did it. Yeah. And so, yeah. Just, it, you've got to recognize you were great. It is a different body. Yep. Molecularly, cellularly, epigenetics. Yeah. Everything about it is different. So, you have the opportunity to go back and stuff that didn't work when you were just getting started. Might work now, or might end up putting you in a whole different place that you never even knew existed. That's such a good point. That's and and like the whole thing. That's why I say you know wait until you're fat adapted to do some of these other things. Um, some people I've had like friends of mine who are powerlifters who went straight from a Western diet to carnivore and cutting and cutting fat and they did great. Um, but I always talk about my sons. You know my sons when we really got strict with keto. We were like, we're gonna get you guys some lilies, we're gonna give you some, and they're like, blah, pilly nuts, hated them, everything. All of a sudden, those things now are like, they love them, you know? So yeah. your taste buds will change too. Someone over here, was it? Yes. Um, thank you for the wonderful work you do. Oh, thank uh, you. Really appreciate it. Um, I was very strict until 18, 15, 5, mm -hmm. almost three years, and wasn't getting, was getting some results, but wasn't getting all the results in terms of sleep, sleep quality, and new brain suffering. And then, thanks to Peter Khan last year and Amber Hearn, oh, yeah. I started. <laughs> She's one of my favorite people, I love her. She's phenomenal. Yep. She's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so, it's only nine months. Um, the bad thing is, I put on 20 pounds, mm -hmm. and it's fat. And it's fat. Yeah, okay. I don't know, it's fat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! <laughs> 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 That's no huge. stevia, no tea. I grew up on wheat, rooibos tea. I don't do that anymore. Like it feels like the plants were trying to kill me, <laughs> in the sense that um, now I've got all these incredible, um, amazing things that are happening to me. But the fat stubbornly sits there, and I'm trying to love it because I'm sleeping. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I haven't. I mean, I'm sleeping without melatonin. Yeah. I didn't know it was possible for a human to sleep without melatonin. Wow, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can make my own. You know? Yeah, that's great. Um, so there are all these things. But here's my question. Is that for someone who's as kind of eating disordered and metabolically deranged as I was, um, and keto help, it feels like there's something truly magical about the power of these. Yeah. I mean, it really does. Yeah. I don't want to be that person. I don't either. It's so hard for me. It's so hard. I'm like, I don't want to be hyperbolic and I don't want to be like that, but it, what can I do? Yeah. Before they go through puberty, and it's almost as if they can't make that big transition. And I'm wondering if it's the same thing. I mean, the fun part of my diatribe is um, 
I've started to experience things physically. I mean, I've always had the sense of myself as a very lazy person. And I now understand the connection between health and exercise, that if you feel good, your body is like a Rottweiler panting at the front door going, you better take me for a walk. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's what's happening. I'm wanting to sprint. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, juggling with my husband for the heavy grocery bags so <laughs> I can carry them. That is and, awesome. I mean, it's like, can a human being change this radically at this point in their life? Sure. After having done traditional hardcore keto, mm -hmm. Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> whatever. I mean, is this is this something you're encountering? Are there other people like me, or am I alone in my madness? I have I have seen other people that have gained weight. I haven't I haven't had like all those details that you just told me. So I think that I really like the way you put it because you have a list of things that you had issues with. And if I'm doing like a side to side comparison and I'm like, gain 20 pounds of fat, but then it's like sleep better, more energy, this, 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 this. You know, Leanne just made a, a really good post about this. Great post. Yeah, you know, like she feels better than she's ever felt and she... Is she doing well? She's curious about it, I think. We need to talk about it a little. I wanna see, I don't know if she's gonna do it, but I, I she just, in general, feels like, you know, maybe I'm not the leanest I've ever been, but I feel the best I've ever felt. And I think there's something to be said about that. You know, we're not all supposed to be, you know, shreddy like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, because a lot of the time with, with bodybuilding, these people look amazing. They are about to die. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, 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 yes, you look awesome, but you, you, like, you can't pick up this thing, you know, you, so, you know, it, it health, our thoughts about health and, and um, appearance are so messed up, right? We automatically think like that someone looks a certain way that they're healthy. And you know, it, for all of us, it always goes back to all, like, all these other things. You know, we, you know we, we may look a certain way. This is what our body's supposed to be. I'm not saying that you're, you're stuck to that. I would never believe that because I've always been of the mind that um, unless you know, you're five foot five, you're not... You're not going to be, unless you're Muggsy Bogues, you're not going to go to the N NBA. You know, it's just, you're not. Um, but we can change things. You know, we really do. I always like philosophically the idea that I can change things and I can change all these things. And so I think that there is a possibility. But then I also think we have to be comfortable with the idea that, you know, this is what our body likes and this is where we perform the best. And we have to think about what we want to balance, you know, what's more important. Like if you can get to a point where maybe your sleep is a little bit less, but then you're more leaner and it's still acceptable, you know, I think that's something to think about, but we always got to kind of balance those things. I'm going to leave this here first before I go to the next one because I just, I have to plug us. And plus, uh, Maura's, uh, this is Maura's new uh, Fatfield Mom logo that you guys are going to see. So, so uh, do I have time for one more question? One more question, okay. Oh, yeah, this is a, who, who was, yeah, Carnia Apparel, you know, and so I, we have a lot of them, and we, we all, this whole family has them, but we were smart enough not to wear them at the same time because we're not cornballs, um, <laughs> but yeah, so Mata wore hers one day, the boys wore theirs yesterday, I wore mine today, um, so if you guys don't have, if you have more, just um, come see me, or we'll go, I'll go outside and we'll answer a few more questions, I just want to respect everybody who's coming after, so thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.